Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Governments in the UK, US and Australia have asked Facebook in an open letter to roll back plans to bring end-to-end encryption to all of its platforms. Google is showing off stunning new augmented reality features coming to web and mobile apps soon. After analyzing a database containing 3 billion leaked credentials from security breaches, the Microsoft Threat Research Team determined that more than 44 million user accounts had a serious security problem. We'll tell you what you need to know. And Intel is making LiDAR affordable with a new palm-sized camera. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. All right, here's some quick honorable mentions this week. Larry Page and Sergey Brin, co-founders of Google, have stepped down from their positions as its CEO and president, respectively, with immediate effect at its parent company of Alphabet, Inc. However, both will continue their involvement as co-founders, shareholders, and members of Alphabet's board of directors. Going forward, Sundar Pichai, Google's chief executive, will become the CEO of both Google and Alphabet. He will assume the role of managing Alphabet's investments in its portfolio of other bets in areas including self-driving cars and life sciences. Besides this, he will also remain a member of Alphabet's board of director, directors. The stepping down of Page and Brin represents the end of an era for Google that was founded by both in 1998 while there were PhD students at Stanford University. Despite not holding important management roles at Alphabet, the two plan to continue talking with Pichai regularly. And Mexican cops have pre-ordered a fleet of Cybertrucks. Having pre-ordered 15 Tesla Cybertrucks that makes the Mexican city of San Luis Potoso, Potosi the second to share plans to put police officers in Cybertrucks following Dubai's announcement a couple weeks back. The San Luis Potosi government is reportedly interested in replacing its internal combustion engine vehicles with the truck to cut down on maintenance costs and save money in the long run. Adrian Esper Cardenas, mayor of San Luis Potosi, described the purchase as, quote, common sense, end quote. He added that the city will also use some of the 15 trucks for tasks like picking up trash around the city. It would be simple for the city to reverse course if it changes its mind, because all it takes to pre-order a truck is a fully refundable $100 deposit. That way, if the police force gets cold feet and it thinks that the trucks are not quite meatball-proof windows, it could still completely black out before actually buying Tesla's trucks. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Governments in the UK, US and Australia have asked Facebook in an open letter to roll back plans to bring end-to-end encryption to all of its platforms. Facebook, who has been the center of many privacy scandals, responds that everyone has the right to a private conversation. It's the latest in a battle between privacy and safety, which has been played out between governments and tech firms ever since digital communication became mass market. End-to-end encryption is a secure way of sending information so that only the intended receiver can read it. The information is encrypted while it is still on the sender's device and is only decrypted when it reaches the person intended. Nobody, not even the platform owner, has the keys to unlock it. The UK and the US have just signed a historic agreement to give each other much faster access to private conversations, cutting down the time from months or years to weeks weeks or days. But that agreement could potentially be rendered a bit useless if the messages are encrypted. Setting up a government backdoor is not the answer either, as Amnesty International pointed out, quote, proposals for a backdoor have repeatedly been shown to be unworkable. There is no middle ground. If law enforcement is allowed to circumvent encryption, then anybody can, end quote. Professor Alan Woodward, a security expert at the University of Surrey and a consultant to Europol, Europol, gave a good analogy when he said, quote, a backdoor is rather like leaving a key under the mat. Once somebody knows it's there, anyone can walk in, end quote. Hmm. So. Interesting story. I really think that this is going to sound weird okay so i know that emails are not private Mm -hmm. and i assume that facebook messages are not private 
Mm-hmm. So I don't think that they should be. They should not be private. But it's not because they're private. not. They because shouldn't they, be. They just, <laughs> it's not about private. It's about encryption. And so right. I, I think the, the issue in this case is the fact that when there is legal proceedings going on and yeah. the police are doing investigations, and a lot of times it could be a national security issue. It could be a, uh, you know, a, a police investigation that is about a safety or, mm-hmm. you know, like drug runners or whatever. Uh, the fact that the police need to be able to access those devices. I mean, we saw this a couple of years ago with uh, Apple and their security needing the fingerprints. And unless you had, you know, the person's thumbprint, you couldn't get past the yeah. encryption, all that kind of stuff. And so there's always been this battle on the encryption front of can law enforcement get access to it and what is acceptable and what is not. And so, uh, I mean, at the beginning, there was this idea of, yes, for sure, we could, you know, I think it makes sense for law enforcement to have encryption. But then as soon as you get things like, um, you know, the Edward Snowden and all of that kind of breach that's coming out through that, that scandal, you're, you have people going, hold on, we can't trust you with that information. Mm-hmm. We can't trust you to follow the court process properly where you're supposed to go to a judge. Now you're bypassing that with, you know, fake warrants to make it happen. I think that's how it played out if my memory serves. And so now people are going, I don't think we can trust you with the encryption. Uh, you know, and it's, I, I mean, the story is an interesting point because you're right. If you do give that access, then anybody has access as long as they can get to that if they know the key. So where is that bottom line? Here's where the tricky thing is in my mind, and maybe I'm oversimplifying it. But when I first had a phone, it was on a party line. Okay. So there was no privacy, right? Like anybody could pick up. Yeah. There was no privacy. I don't understand it's what this is. a little bit different now, though. It's, yeah, it's different, but it's really... Oh, all the kids listening tonight. <laughs> like, like, party what? line. Party line. <laughs> That's right. So what wow, I don't we just dated is, ourselves. is why one person needs to have another conversation with another person and have it completely locked down. I feel like that was never our thing. Uh, we never had that. But you also <laughs> didn't use your party line for, you know, international terrorism. Right. And if I were to be using my party line for international terrorism, I'd want it to be encrypted. So I don't think it should be encrypted (laughs) at all. Yeah. No, I I understand. Yes. I mean, it really comes down to the, and I hear this argument all the time. If you're not doing anything wrong, why do you care? Yes. And I get that argument. Uh, It it makes sense. If you're not doing anything wrong, why, why should you care? But the fact is, there's still the potential that you might not be doing anything wrong. But now, if somebody decides you, they're going to investigate you. Anything that you're doing is no longer going to be protected. But if I work under the assumption that nothing is private, I'm not going to do anything in these weird realms that I would hope to stay private. Right, but where is that line? And I think that's what this story comes to, is where is the line between acceptable, and I don't want to say intrusion, but... That really is what it comes down to. If you're yeah. going to break the encryption, it is a, an element of intrusion. It might be for good means, but where is that acceptable line between intrusion and privacy? And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there's a safe answer because you're always going to have two sides of the story. You're going to have the, the, the privacy side and you're going to have the law enforcement side. And then there's going to be people in the middle going, I don't know. Yeah. It, it's, it's interesting to watch how this is playing out in the courts. And I think where it's going to really come to head and you're going to start seeing movement in a definitive way is in the European courts because of all of the legislation that they're putting in place. I think Mm -hmm. that's where if there's going to be a breakthrough that um, allows for that healthy balance, I think Europe is where you're going to see it. All right. Google is showing off stunning new augmented reality features coming to web and mobile apps soon. Google has been quietly working to improve its augmented reality platform, Arcor, since its official launch early last year. Now the company says it's ready to unveil some of the next generation upgrades to depth detection and physics that they've achieved, promising to make AR experiences seem much more realistic in the near future. The upgrades, part of Arcor's all new All new Depth API will soon allow developers to perform what's known as occlusion, which is when an artificial object can be blocked from view by real world objects in a scene. Place a virtual cat in your living room, for instance, and you can see it disappear from view when you angle your camera in a way that places a bed or a table or some other object in between. 
The result is a more believable scene because the depth detection going on under the hood means that your smartphone better understands every object in a scene and how far apart each object is from one another. Google says that it's able to do this through optimizing existing software so that you won't need to buy a new phone with a specific sensor or a type of processor. If you have a phone that supports our core, which is pretty much every new Android phone released in the last few years, you'll be able to access these new features directly on the device with no help from the cloud. Pokemon Go creator Niantic showed off a video of, occlusion, of an occlusion demo featuring a tiny virtual Pikachu darting around an urban plaza, dashing in between objects and blending seamlessly in with the environment. That was in July 2018. But it was just a video and not a demo running on a device in real time. Google says the advancements will be made available to developers in the future after it works more, more closely with developers and other collaborators to polish off some of its approaches. These go beyond occlusion and into more realistic physics and 3D mapping. Google has developed a way for AI, AR objects to interact with the real world more realistically, move through the environment in a way a real world 3D object would, and interact with services like you might expect physical matter would. The company doesn't have a timeline for when it does expect to release this tool set more broadly, but it's likely these capabilities will be showing up in apps and AR web experiences sometime next year. This is cool. This is cool. I, I, I mean, as you're reading the story, I'm going, what in the world would I use this for? But I think this can take things like AR games yep. uh, to a whole new level. Uh, and I can also see this being the beginnings of a whole new way of doing um, living AR visual wear. Right. So, for instance, I mean, if you go back to that episode of Star Trek Next Generation, uh, I think it, the episode was called The Game, where they had that little headset, and as they're walking around, there's like these balls and, you know, the, where they're throwing the balls into mm -hmm. these cyclones and all that kind of stuff. I can see this opening up the door to having, you know, VR goggles that instead of our having that opaque screen, having a transparent screen so that it changes the way you do your games. So you would really like this. I think this is really fascinating how they're moving it forward. Uh, my fear, though, is that, you know, as humans, we can't be trusted. <laughs> Somebody's going to get hurt. Okay, here's what I like it for. I like it for two reasons that immediately popped into my head. One, randomly, interior design. I feel like oh, okay. mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. can easily then show somebody what their space could look like. Mm -hmm. Well, you could do that now, though. Yeah, but it would be easier. Not with, with occlusion, though. Right, I mean, not that's with true. occlusion. Like, that's wow. true, yeah. yeah. Second, I think therapy for people with um, phobias or PTSD, I think that would work. That's an interesting concept. Yeah. I haven't thought about that one. Yeah, and also games. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and, and that's the way it's going to go initially is, you know, people are going to go, how can we build this into games? Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, that's interesting about mo mobility issues. This does open a whole new realm of how does that play into, uh, say, urban planning? Right. And if you develop an AI map and you look at it going, okay, uh, you know, how would, how would people interact with this? What would be the movement? Like, take, yeah. for instance, like Times Square. Yeah. It's like how, you know, if this happened, how would that impact traffic and, and watching these AI hmm. people walk around by throwing an object in there or if you just place, I, I mean, I, I realize it's kind of backwards use of it, but it'd be mm -hmm. interesting to see from a traffic model standpoint or, or, or a construction model, the hmm. impact that this would have, uh, you know, could change the way we do the world. Yeah, we agree. <laughs> yes, yeah, And on that note, we've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Corner and th more of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Crypto Corner. And another week has flown by. Not many changes within the price or the market uh, cap 
of our industry is still around 200 billion. Market share of Bitcoin is around 66%. So not many changes there. But as usual, a lot of things to report about. And so the first big one is Ethereum upgraded this weekend to Istanbul, mm -hmm. which means uh, a bit more performant, uh, cheaper and a bit more resilient. But it's not the big upgrade to Ethereum 2.0. That will come hopefully uh, beginning of, of next year. The next one is Litecoin. The Litecoin Foundation created a trust fund to address privacy issues by using the Mimblewimble protocol, which is great news because that's exactly what we also need in the Bitcoin protocol. Um, <clears throat> an interesting statistic is decentralized finance, or as they say it in modern English, DeFi, uh, <clears throat> on, the Ethereum pro uh, on the Ethereum network. That was in 1997 around 10 million US dollars. Um, last month it was 650 million. So an exponential growth in uh, decentralized finance on the Ethereum blockchain. And the 650 million, by the way, is equivalent to around 2% of all ETH available in the market. So it's significant. Then the voice um, uh, network, which uh, is an EOS-based EOS, uh, uh, media platform, competitor, they want to be competitor to Facebook and so on. They will launch their beta version soon. Uh, that's interesting because uh, Block One, that is the company behind this uh, system, they generated 4 billion US dollars uh, uh, during the ICO of EOS. So they've got a lot of money uh, that they can throw behind this year. And last but not least in the news section is British Virgin Islands. They announced that they're uh, converting uh, their US back uh, dollar to a digital currency. So that's the next one, that uh, country that will uh, have their currency on a blockchain. Now, <clears throat> subject of the week is uh, exchange. And why an exchange? Because you can make a lot of mistakes there if you don't choose the right uh, exchange. And there are four things that you have to be really careful with when uh, choosing an exchange. First, is it a regulated exchange? And to give you an example, there's an exchange called IDAX, IDAX, that's based in Mongolia. So you know that if something happens there, you have got no chance of recovering your money. I assume that. <clears throat> uh, and with that, you have to be careful that with every other exchange that you have got at least a chance to talk to somebody. And that's usually the case with regulated exchanges. Second is, is it a KYC AML uh, uh, exchange? Um, so are they asking you for the passport picture? Don't send those things to companies or exchanges or website you've never heard of, or you don't have any idea who's sitting behind uh, that exchange. Yeah, because you never know what they're going to do with your passport or your driver's license. What are they going to do with your data? Is it safely stored? You don't know that. So make sure that you ha you've got an answer to that question. Third is so-called fake trading or wash trading, which is uh, forbidden in the US and in Europe, but it's allowed in Asia. And that means that the exchange is faking uh, trade volume. Uh, <clears throat> they're saying that around 90% of Bitcoin's a volume that you see on coin market cap it's around 1 billion US dollars the reality it's only around um, 100 million so make sure that there's enough liquidity of your token or coin and last is the fees just be careful with the fees check that before you do a trade uh, it can be up to 30 percent high three zero percent high um, if, if you make a mistake so those are the four points you need to, to consider when uh, uh, choosing the right exchange for your token. And that's, that's for me. So I wish you a great week and see you next week. Thanks for watching. Thanks, Robert. Just a reminder, this is not financial advice. We're just sharing what's happening in the crypto market. The Microsoft Threat Research Team analyzed billions of login credentials that had been leaked following security breaches. These came from multiple sources, including law enforcement and publicly accessible databases. Considering the data breaches are known to have exposed 4.1 billion records in the first six months of 2019 alone, there's obviously plenty of this kind of credential data floating around. And plenty that is traded across dark web markets. 
Security researchers analyze this breach data and by doing so, it's possible to get an idea of the most commonly reused and therefore insecure passwords. The Microsoft Identity Threat Research Team was also looking for these compromised credentials to cross-check against the Microsoft user ecosystem. Across just the first three months of 2019, Microsoft found some 44 million accounts that were reusing passwords found within those breached credential databases. You might think that 44 million reused passwords out of more than 3 billion breached credentials isn't too bad a percentage unless you're one of those Azure AD or Microsoft account holders with the password problem, of course. It's, a, it's dangerous to think that you are safe just because you don't use any of the headline passwords mentioned in the most reused passwords list that regular, regularly appears online, as threat actors use a variety of techniques to reveal login credentials. If one of your passwords turns up in a breach database and you use it to access your email account, for example, it's often game over as far as your security is concerned. Microsoft warns about how this data is commonly used in what's known as a breach replay attack. Quote, once a threat actor gets a hold of a spilled credentials or credentials in the wild, they can try to execute a breach replay attack. In this attack, the actor tries tries out the same credentials on different services service accounts to see if there's a match end quote as far as the leaked credentials that the threat research team found during this analysis are concerned microsoft has confirmed that consumers need to take quote no additional action end quote as they are already forced a password reset so what can we do to protect our accounts? The report goes on to say, quote, our numbers show that 99.9% .9 of identity attacks have been thwarted by turning on multi-factor authentication, end quote. Wow. 99.9% yes. have been thwarted. So yep. we know I am not the best with my passwords. I know that. You're learning. I'm learning. And yeah. I know I would never have known how bad I was if not for the show. <laughs> <laughs> but now I know I need multi-factor authentication. I'm going to need it because right, yeah. I know that even if I think I have the safest password out there, there's a computer out there that's just picking away and will one day figure it out. Well, and do you know what's neat about multi-factor authentication, Sasha, is that even if you have a weak password, yeah. if you have MFA or 2FA, whatever you want to call it, then you're much more protected because they only have that one factor. They only have the password. Well, they also need your phone or your right. SMS or whatever else, So right? I can go back to passwords I can remember. <laughs> In some regards, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, as yeah. long as it's that only for good. one site. Yes, that's fine with me. Yeah, you I don't can, want to repeat yeah. passwords across multiple sites. But even if you were to repeat passwords and have multi-factor authentication, you'd be okay. I mean, right. you don't want to, but you'd be okay. Yeah. Right? It's, uh, I mean, it is concerning that people still continue to use the same password, but I would venture to guess that almost every one of those people uh, do not have some sort of a password keeper software. I would say you're wrong. And here's why I know. Because I am one of those people. Um, so well, most people maybe it's have just the same password because it's easy to remember. It's poor practice, it's though. Bad maybe practice. it's just yeah. bad easy. practice. Okay, so here's what happens: is I try a password and it says wrong password, or I try a password and it says your password's expired. You have to come up with a new password, and I just in a rush put in a password that I no you know oh, and then i think i'll come back to that later and i'll change it yeah you never do i don't i have i have a problem <laughs> and my problem is <laughs> well admitting it is the first step right so <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> passwords anonymous because aka pa we're gonna call this pa when i use a password generator which i have done yeah. which has rendered my laptop useless in this moment no that was but you that was me yep. okay yeah. but 
like I use a password generator and this is big long string of characters that I just copy paste yeah. into things, right? Which is well, great. It, it, but then what a wonderful world as far as security goes if none of the users know their passwords. Think about that. You think that sounds crazy, but that is the perfect scenario. Yes. Yeah, if I fire a staff member and they because they've compromised data or they've done something wrong, um, I don't want them to be able to walk away with passwords that yeah. they remember. Exactly. I promise you, I don't know any of my own personal passwords right now. That's except great. For my master password on my password. Thing. That's the way it should be. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. Now, but then there is the scenario that you've encountered, Sasha, yes. where your Chromebook, you have to log into your Chromebook. So you have to know your Chrome password, which is your Google password, right? Right. So the trick is, is to have a simple enough password that you remember. So I use password recipes, not passwords. So you think about a recipe. We've talked about that on the show before, and I'll talk yes. about it again. But knowing your recipe, you're able to punch in your password. So my password is like this big, long thing because it's like, it's like all these different factors for a recipe for my password. And so it's mul like a hacker could never figure it out. It's all kinds of words and punctuations and everything else. But I remember it because I know the recipe. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you and, and then in addition to that, I have multi-factor authentication enabled on my Google account. So even though I have a password that I'm entering in because I remember the recipe. So think about this. What if that computer had a key logger? What if I was logging into my Google account to check my Gmail from a library computer where someone says it has installed a, uh, a key logger? Right. Now they know my password. Right. So now do they have access to my Google account? No. They don't have my phone because I've got multi-factor authentication enabled. So every time I try to uh, log into my Google account or my Chromebook, it pops up on my phone. Do you want to authorize this? Yes. It's a simple click. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, you need to enable that. I want I want that now. Yeah. I, do, I will say, as far as the key logger thing goes, that I would never fall victim to that because I don't know my passwords and I just copy-paste. So they would only be logging the copy and the but paste. But there are co uh, uh, clipboard um, oh, loggers dude, as well. Of yeah. course yes. there are. Yes, of course. Yep. Oh, you have to have multi-factor yep. authentication. Two-factor authentication or yep. multi-factor authentication. That's for the win. Mm -hmm. I wish there was a way, and I, mean, I suppose in theory it could be done, but I wish when there was a data breach for a company that there would be a way to purge the passwords and ensure that your password keeper software would prevent you from ever using that again. <laughs> Like I know with Wouldn't mine, nice? I, I get alerts. We're almost that, there, Jeff. I know, but I like I know for mine, I get alerts that it runs an audit of all my passwords because sure. at this point, I'm now up over probably 250 different passwords, and it's like, by the way, you've you you've reused this a couple times now. And when I look at it, it's like, oh, that's a site I haven't logged into in 10 years. Mm -hmm. Like clearly, I, yeah. I don't yeah. use it anymore. But it's the same password that you're using on something that you use every day, uh, well, which is the scary thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But it'd be nice if there was that's a way the one to wipe them out and never allow you to use it again. Yeah. That comes down to common sense, though. I know. And um, what we are at, like with MyKey, so M-Y-K-I, for example, with LastPass, with um, uh, Have I Been Owned, as examples, Google Chrome now features it built in. When passwords that you use have been compromised, you receive alerts that uh, that let you know. And in fact, I I recently received an alert that one of my passwords was compromised. I recognized it because it said, this is your password. And so, oh yeah, my password has been compromised. So what did I do? I did a dump of my uh, LastPass password database, and I searched for that password, and I found all of the sites that I use that I had stupidly shared the same password with because it was one of my plain text passwords. Right. And I had found about maybe six or seven sites where I had used this password from years ago. And so I went through and I went through check, 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 check. And I changed the password on every single one of those sites to a nice strong password. Yes. So now, whether it was compromised or not, um, that password is now secure. 
What I am not able to protect against is the fact that the data that they were able to, to accumulate during that breach, they now have access to. So that could be that could be the phone call that comes in and says, hi, we're calling from Microsoft and we're looking at your computer. Like that could be any kind of phishing scam, spear phishing scam, uh, whatever it may be, because they now have data on me. However, my password is no longer uh, an issue. So right. they can't get access that, to my accounts. That actually helps me to know that you've actually had the same problem I have. Everyone does, Sasha. Oh, but everyone. the thing is, is that you've got to take action. Yes. So where I receive the notification that my password has been compromised, I found the six other sites that yeah. use that password because I had shared that password with other sites, and I changed the password. Right. And right. what you said is very crucial because in your news story, Sasha, you said, that they're now using the compromised data mm -hmm. in order to do a secondary attack. Yes. To see if maybe that password that you used on MySpace way back in the day might be the same password that you're now using on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and so they try those things. Of they course. attack those things. And you would be none the wiser until finally they get in. And guess what they do? They change your password. Nice. And then you can't access your account. Yeah. Right. And so we, you've got to be proactive. And I will say, like the the password generators that pass that generate these really strong, mm -hmm. awesome passwords, they're amazing. Yeah. But I think every single person has generated their own password that they're super proud of, and they kind of feel <laughs> a little bit of attachment to. Yeah. Right. And then you kind of want to use it, but you shouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and I think the 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 thing that we hesitate with is that these big long passwords that are 64 characters long how will i ever remember that and the key point is you don't need to know it yes. you yes. don't need to remember it you need to have a password manager that is able to input that into the login form so that it will get you into the system and you never need to know that password exactly that's the key and point that's it. Mm -hmm. now, yes. I know we have to move on, yeah, we but do. one quick thought with this. I mean, I'm thinking about what you're saying, Robbie, about the the you know, replay attacks where they're checking out other sites. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that you have two-factor authentication. So take, for instance, Facebook. You can have your two-factor authentication, whereas if they get in, they change the password, but they can also now change the cell phone that you use for your two-factor authentication. So once they're in... Then they, they can now change that cell that number so that when you anything. go, oh, I'm locked out. Jeff, we're talking about social media here. What about banking? Mm -hmm. well, exactly. Where are the funds going to go that they now have access to? Right. Right. So is there a way, and maybe they're doing this already, but I'm thinking for a sophisticated web service, whether it be banking or whatever, is there a way for them to put in almost three-factor authentication with some smart trends. For instance, uh, they recognize that normally you log in from an IP address that's in a specific area of the country. Suddenly, you log in with your password from an IP address totally somewhere else, and then they instantly go to change your phone number. Would the site go, you're in, that's not you, we're locking you out? Well, this is yeah. exactly why we use the term multi-factor authentication, not necessarily two-factor two -factor. authentication, yes. right? So multi-factor authentication could be five factors, right? When I log in, if I want to remote into the studio from home, there are th uh, three or four factors, I think. So it's multi-factor authentication. Anyway, so it's not two-factor authentication. It takes four factors in order for me to get into the studio. Huh. So, yeah, there's. Uh, but as far as the lockdowns go, I mean, that's firewalling. That's... That's a whole other can mm -hmm. of worms. Yeah. That'll be in a news story next week. I know. Yeah. We just need to stupid proof people. That's yeah. the problem. Intel is adding a tiny LiDAR sensor to its RealSense range, claiming the Intel RealSense LiDAR, LiDAR camera L515 is the world's smallest laser rangefinder, not to mention one of the most affordable. Taking technology familiar from autonomous cars and robotics, the L515 then packages it down into a small enough form factor that it could allow compact smart devices to scan the world in 3D. LiDAR works by using a rapidly scanning laser, bouncing points of light off surrounding objects. By measuring the time taken for that light to reflect back, it can create a 3D map or a point cloud of the world around that sensor. That accuracy has made it the centerpiece of many self-driving 
project, self-driving car projects, among other fields. Traditionally, though, LiDAR has been hamstrung by two key factors, size and price. Early LiDAR sensors, particularly those with suitable range for automotive applications, have been huge, like a spinning trash can mounted on top of the vehicle's roof. They've also cost tens of thousands of dollars or more. Intel's L515 taps into the growing category of solid state LiDAR, however, and it's cheap enough at, at arriving just at um, $349. Wow. The chip maker developed its own tiny microelectromechanical system, or MEMS, mirror that allows the laser to scan the scene but at reduced power. Despite requiring less than 3.5 watts, Intel says that the L515 can still track 3D objects at a range of up to 30 feet at over 23 million accurate depth pixels per second with a depth resolution of 1024 by 768 at 30 frames per second. Arguably more exciting, though, is the potential for new applications and new users where LiDAR has traditionally been out of reach. Smoothing that transition is the fact that the L515 uses the same RealSense SDK 2.0 as Intel's other current RealSense cameras, released under an open source license and compatible with Windows, Linux, Android, and Mac OS, along with multiple platforms including Unity, Unreal, and even Python. Unreal. Oh, man. Do you guys remember the first time that we heard of LiDAR? Yes! The Monkey Kingdom book. Yes! It A was big... It. It was the lost city of the monkey <sighs> god, right? Oh, the monkey god. That's right. Not monkey yeah. kingdom. Yes. The plane's most distinctive feature features are two struts or booms that extend behind the wings. Once a cheerful red and white, the paint job on this plane was full of patches and strips that had peeled off, and an ugly streak of oil ran down the fuselage from the forward engine. A big green LIDAR box almost filled the interior of the plane. Think about the size of this thing. That is, right? Yeah, that is, but I mean, that was this, some pretty sophisticated light Yeah, on. This is too, the, though. I, I, I'm not done. Oh, okay, this fine. sleek, advanced... Out, yeah. This <laughs> sleek, advanced, and costly piece of technology, so top secret that it had to be guarded by soldiers, was being schlepped around in a shabby flying tin can, or so it seemed to my inexpert eye. That's Douglas Preston from The Lost City of the Monkey God. He was here on the show Still to talk about that. My all-time favorite episodes. Yeah. If you have was not that season seen nine? It. I don't know, Jeff. But season it was, it was any. It, it, it feels like it was yesterday. Just go to our website, yeah. category5.tv, click on search and click in uh, Lost yeah. City of the Monkey God. You'll find it. Which right. first made us excited about LiDAR. Yes. I think but so. This, Absolutely. This story the technology. brings LiDAR to us, right? Mm -hmm. This was exciting that it existed and yep. that it was capable and useful in real world applications. But right. what, I, what I'm saying is like, this is uh, Douglas Preston went to the city of the monkey god with a plane full of lidar technology and now it's fitting in something that's like 60 millimeters right can right you, what can you use that for i wonder Could okay. you use oh, it for the first thing i thought of ar yeah. 3d movies 3D Not movies? 3D the way we have it now. Interactive, Interactive 3D movies. Interactive 3D movies. Could you imagine... No, like I can't. An action, take, for instance, like an Avengers movie. Mm -hmm. But it's filmed with 3D LiDAR technology. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. not only can you be oh watching, my. but you're sitting there going, hold on. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Oh, check out the other side of that fight. Okay. Like, that would be cool. Combine nice. that with the technology that... Android is bringing about that allows things to go behind other objects. Right. Right. right? Yeah. And now we've got LiDAR to show us those objects in 3D space. Well, remember we had the story with the cane that like was a smart yes. cane that could have a conversation with you about what was around? What if that huh. cane had LiDAR on it? I mean, it would just make it that much more, more attuned to yeah. 
what obstacles are in the way. So could right. this be something, I mean, uh, we've gone from mega server that fills a room to something that fills a box to something that fits in the pocket. Now we've got LiDAR that fills a plane that now fills like a 62 millimeter device. And now can it fit into my optics, for example, so that I can do augmented reality? Like, is this, everything is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, and I mean, the interesting applications from a, say, a security or an investigation standpoint, like, could you imagine um, all vehicles or cell phones, whatever, are equipped, are equipped with LiDAR mm. through this tech? And I granted, this is, we're talking about this size. Yeah. Eventually, we're probably going to get much smaller. That's it. But imagine if you can get LiDAR onto a cell phone. Yes. And mm -hmm. you get into a car <laughs> accident. Ah. And the first thing you do when you pull out is you go, ping, and you LiDAR the entire accident scene. Holy cow, dude. <laughs> Have you ever seen like the 3D version of Google Earth? Like, yeah. so yeah. imagine if your phone had LiDAR capabilities because that's where we're going. And you could take a picture and all of a sudden you can put that in VR space. Yes. Right. Sasha, you can put on your VR headset and, and you can be in that realm. Right. See, I, and I'm thinking from search and rescue standpoint. Yeah. Like, imagine if phones were equipped with LiDAR. I mean, like, we have the Amber Alert system. Mm -hmm. What if knowing, you know, so-and-so has been kidnapped or okay, they're missing, okay. but using a UUID through a government database, they go, boom, let's run a LiDAR scan. You know what? That's all fine and good, but I'm thinking more, what about family? What about people that I love that have passed on that I can enter a virtual reality space and and walk into walk into think about this the yeah. video of an anniversary party or a birthday party and actually like through vr be able to enter it because lidar gives the capability for my vr to be able to interact with the video in oh. such a way that it sees the depth and then we integrate this capability of things to go behind objects and things right. so i can walk around a live so. not a live but a video scene yeah there's always that like point of heartbreak when you like for example dave and i are renovating um his family home in newfoundland mm. and there's that point where it's a heartbreak because he has to take down some of his old memories like his old right. childhood bedroom is is painted in these beautiful smurf you know collage sort oh, of yeah, things. Yeah. Wouldn't it have been awesome to be able to do like a LiDAR and be able to be able to <laughs> walk through that yeah. as opposed to just But will LiDAR pick it? up color? Like, I don't think LiDAR is Well, you see, no, 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 Jeff, you you're missing it. You're combining yeah. LiDAR technology, so depth yeah. with right. the visual. So yeah. you've got 360 video plus LiDAR, right? Yeah. So this is all part of the video. So now not only can I look around in VR, which we can already do. Okay. I can already take a 360 video. I have 360 mm -hmm. cameras here. You're welcome to borrow them. And you can then look around in mm -hmm. VR space, but with LIDAR, I can walk around in that VR space. So Consider with, the difference. With LIDAR filming, say, going back to the original idea that I mentioned about movies. Yeah. yeah. Like, I'm sitting here going, okay, throw on a VR headset. Suddenly, we're now in, like, Star Trek holodeck realms. Yes. Like, well, is, but not interactive No, not physically. interactive, but I mean, but from the standpoint of, you know, if you could build, like, you know, say you walk around New York City and you LIDAR the city... Yeah. I mean, this is what Google is already doing. There, but suddenly you now Essentially. have like VR tours where, you know, maybe somebody has mobility issues and it's like, I can't get to New York. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm thinking of my in laws who are from Holland. Yeah. They, my mom would love to go back to Holland, but because of health issues, she can't get on the plane. I right. love the idea. So, how neat would it be to say, hey, mom, here's uh, the, the town you grew up in. Somebody lidar that town. Would you like to VR that and actually walk mm. around? Like, that would be huge. Awesome. For her. Yes. Awesome. I love it. So cool. Oh, yeah. That is amazing. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com newsroom. 
from the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman.